get up at a consistent time. Weekends are not an exception. Um, pick a time, get up at it. Go to bed at a consistent time. Um, don't use your phone before bed or try, try not to, or use some of these, these light filters that are out there. Use some of these apps, especially if you're on your computer, use Flux, like use some of these programs. Learn to perform practical lessons so that you can immediately learn to optimize your health, happiness, and performance. Welcome to Learn to Perform. I'm your guest, Braden Ostepchuk, and today's guest is someone I've, who I've called a coach, mentor, advisor, and friend, Steve Salagi. Steve grew up in Trail, British Columbia, and was big into baseball, hockey, and powerlifting. In fact, as a young man, he was a competitive powerlifter with some absurd numbers, including a 405-pound bench press, a 555-pound squat, and a 515-pound deadlift, all while weighing 148 pounds. And as he was ripping out pull-ups like it was nobody's business, he attended the University of Lethbridge and received his bachelor's in kinesiology, master's in kinesiology and exercise science, and also became a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Building off his strong background and experience in exercise science and competitive sport, he served as a strength and conditioning coach for the Lethbridge Hurricanes of the Western Hockey League for five years, the University of Lethbridge, working with CIS athletes across all sports for six years, and also running a high performance training program in the off season, which is where I first met and trained with Steve. As a bonus, he was also able to attend the Atlanta Thrashers training camp as a strength and conditioning consultant prior to their move to Winnipeg. Currently, it's hard to describe what Steve does because he does everything. He is a rehab consultant for a major insurance company, a full-time realtor, the director of ice hockey at Next Move Network, which is a powerful network of licensed luxury real estate professionals who collaborate to manage the full life cycle of real estate acquisitions and sales, servicing the unique needs of the private client in over 100 inter international markets, with clients including athletes in the NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, and also actresses, actors, and musicians. He's also been a city council board member, a personal trainer, and a business consultant on the side. If you want to talk about high efficiency and performance, Steve is your guy. And I'm pretty sure he has never missed a leg day throughout all of this. So in a nutshell, Steve embodies what Learn to Perform is all about. He is a great learner, a high performer, and a terrific resource for others. If I needed advice about real estate, I'd call Steve. Questions about squat variations, powerlifting, and strategic supersets, I'd call Steve. Social media and customer engagement, I'd call Steve. What about techniques for parasympathetic activation, career advice, nutrition, or investing? Again, I'd call Steve. And when I was building this podcast and brand, I called Steve a lot. They say rising tide lifts all the boats, which is why I'm grateful to have a relationship with Steve as he certainly inspires me to become a better person every day. And with that, welcome Steve, and thank you so much for carving out some time to speak with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> this, was a long, this was a long time coming. <laughs> yeah, but we just it, decided to... It, it, sorry, it, it's funny that you go through the introduction like that and it's like, oh, actually, I, I, I guess I do do a few things. Um, it's funny because all of the folks I went to school with are anesthesiologists and we all joke uh, there's anesthesiologists in the group uh physicians in the group naturopaths in the group um big time financial advisors in the group and then there's steve right <laughs> so sometimes it takes an introduction like that to really realize oh yeah i do have a lot on the go i guess but sure sometimes it doesn't feel like it because i still feel like i have some extra time some days but it's all good yeah and, and that was one of my challenges i've i've had a lot of people where i'd I was always telling my friends about, oh, well, Steve is, you know, a great resource. And I talked to Steve and they're like, well, what does Steve do? And I remember sometimes, or even my parents sometimes asking, because I would bring up Steve and they're like, what does Steve do? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to describe that. I had to do my research to prepare for this. And it turns out it's a laundry list of things that Steve does. It's just Steve's laundry list of to-dos, I guess is what we'll call it. Anyways, being that you're so successful and you've done so many different things, you have experience and expertise in a wide array of industries and specialties and you name it. I want to ask you how you would define high performance because you've worked with high performers, you've coached and trained high performers and you've been a high performer and are still. So in your mind, what is high performance? For me, and, and I know we've talked about this and how to actually define it, but for me, it comes down to one word and that's efficiency. So I believe for, I believe most high performance or anyone into high performance forming at any, I guess, higher level, it's the ability to maximize efficiency, which includes, yes, your health and your performance, your happiness, your three 
pillars, of course, but also, you know, um, anything to do with time management, money management. Um, health is, is one of the biggest things that is obviously the foundation to everything here, but it, it comes down to efficiency. If you can maximize your time and be very, very efficient, you can be as grateful as me to have had all the experiences that I've had because I've been able to not say no to anything. And that has enabled me to A, figure it out as I go and B, take on all sorts of challenges to really broaden my skill set. One of the other things too is, is right now I'm also managing a local gym, which has been very interesting from this pandemic perspective because now it's I'm, I'm able to draw on so many different things that I have done to help with this whole pandemic situation force lockdowns shutdowns um, how to build a member base uh, engagement on social media that type of thing but going back to that high performance piece it's for me it's 100 about efficiency and how to maximize your time right and i like that and this is something that we've talked about before is there used to always be the notion that if you wanted to be successful, you had to become great at one thing, as opposed to being good at a lot of things, which is almost counterintuitive to some people to think that how could you just be good at a lot of things. But I don't think that's what you're saying. I think what you're saying is we can be great at a lot of things instead of great at just one thing. But you can't be great at a lot of things because achieving levels of greatness or levels of high performance requires major time investment and practice and dedication to develop. But if you can become efficiency, or efficient, if you can become ultra efficient in everything you do, you can really cut down on all that kind of wasted time, you can trim off all the fat and you get that high performance product. And so, you know, I love that idea. And like, for example, a lot of the success that you've had and opportunities now running the gym, if you weren't high efficient in your past, highly efficient in your past, then how would you have been able to accumulate enough experiences or enough expertise to be able to get thrown into a situation where you are running a gym in a pandemic, you're managing the business side, the financial side, the actual product side, the training side, you know, I think it just really kind of speaks volumes that efficiency allows you to become great at more than one thing. Absolutely. And, and, you know, there's, there are a lot of, not myself included, but there are a lot of good pro hockey players who are also very good at golf, but they're not going to go make the PGA anytime soon, right? They're, they're good, but it's okay to be 100% at one thing and then 85% at a lot of other things. That's, that's totally fine. And I think in part, that's what high performance is all about is you can be very, very good at a couple things, but you need to also be pretty good at a massive amount of other things as well. And, and Again, that's where this, it all comes down for me. Anyway, it comes down to efficiency um, and time management is one of the biggest things and, and I'll lump things like organization and to-do lists and that type of thing into time management. Sleep gets lumped into time management, which is all under that efficiency umbrella. All right. Yeah, no, I love that. And so if we are going to achieve high levels of performance in multiple areas in our life, we have to be efficient learners. So it's not just enough to be time efficient, but the time that we have to develop new skills and to grow as a person, we have to be efficient with that. And I know you have some experience as a training specialist, I believe it goes back a few years ago. And I know that you're also given your resume, a highly efficient learner. I know you read a lot of books, you do a lot of research, you're constantly learning, listening to podcasts. I'd love for you to share a little bit of what are some of the tactics that you use to be a high efficient learner? And what are things that you've observed in your professional and personal lives? that can be really important for people to take away if they want to become more efficient with their time to maximize their growth and development. I used to spend a ton of time, a ton of time reading and watching YouTube and listening to podcasts. Over the last few years, I have switched from a lot of, I guess, passive approach to learning, which is the reading and listening to the doing. Get out there and do it. Um, and that, that takes me back to even, even strength coaching, right? Um, I never once gave any of you guys an exercise that I couldn't do myself, right? So, so getting out there and how, how could you, how could you coach it if you 
can't do it or really, really understand it yourself. Right. So I've transitioned from being more passive to getting out there and actually going to do it. How are you going to manage a gym? Well, let's go do it and figure it out as we go. Because right. you have the skill set in the background that you've developed. So you can apply that into whatever situation moving forward. It, it bothers me when people don't apply for corporate positions because the qualification list says they need X, Y, and Z. If you have somebody like us sitting on the other side as a hiring manager, we might be intrigued to give somebody who doesn't have X, Y, and Z a pretty good chance at an interview based on their experience. Mm. And that's where, that's where corporations are, go, are going now. You don't necessarily need the degree. You don't necessarily need the certification because I know that I could put you in school or I could get you that certification. You could do it no problem if I hired you because of the skill set that you have. So you can do that on the job, but I want your brain and your mm-hmm. skill set in the position that you're applying for. I can teach you the position, but I can't teach you the skill set that I have. So employers are starting to look for something like that. And I, I hope more start doing that and moving away from just the education-based hiring model, yeah, right? And, and there is something to be said, of course, about um, like even take my master's degree, for example, unless I'm going to teach kinesiology or history or something related to my master's degree at a university or a college was the value there absolutely because of the skill set that I gained during the process of getting my master's Mm -hmm. and it also shows to whether it's employers or other folks listening to this oh great yes Steve has the ability to um take a a two-year project on and see it through and do it and he knows how to talk to professors and academics and, and right so the now i don't want anybody to lose sight of the skill set that they get from the jobs that they're doing and never turn anything down because they might not know how to do it the skill set will teach you along the way so as so for me as a learner it's about going and doing and putting my skill set into practice to figure it out as i go um In university, it was, I guess I was gifted in university in that I could walk into an exam and know the questions that were going to be on the test before even opening the textbook just by listening in lectures. Yep, that's a key point. Jot that down. That's going to be on the test. Learn it, remember it, move on to the next one. I had bigger and better things that I was focusing on, like work during university. It was the piece of paper that I wanted or needed at the time. And that was, that was it. So I was coaching mm-hmm. while I was there. Right. And all through my, my master's degree as well. So, um, I mean, it, that, there you go, there's your efficiency, there's your time management piece as well. But yeah, for me, the adult learning is yes, in part reading and the YouTube and the, the, the podcasts and, it is a lot about actually going and doing. You can you can sit there and tell me all the fascinating things that you've read about or listened to about blood work, for example. But until you go and get your own done and start, you know, listening to the professionals telling you what supplements to take at what time during the day to optimize your performance down to a nano level, then um, you know it's 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 kind of useless until you put it into practice, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, there's so much there that I want to unpack because you had a lot of great points. And one of the first things I'll start with is that I love the idea of the difference between being educated and being intelligent, for example. So you can be educated and not necessarily be competent or be intelligent, but at the same time, you can be the most competent person and the most intelligent person without that formal education. And I have a ton of pride in the degrees that I got from Norwich University. And I think I took so much out of it, but at the same time, if it wasn't paired with application and with experience, that wouldn't have the same value to me that it would have had if it was just independent. And a a great example, I think that I want to share is something I just saw the other day was, uh, I think it must've been on Instagram or something, but there was a post with Elon Musk talking. And as we know, he just became the richest person in the world. And he was talking about when he was starting SpaceX and he was trying to move into aerospace engineering. And I think the interviewer was asking him, so it's like, you had no experience in aerospace engineering and you have no degree in aerospace engineering. And Elon's like, yeah, that's correct. And he's like, and you poured $100 million of your own money into 
an aerospace engineering company? And he's like, yes, that's correct. He's like, why would you do that? He's like, well, I read a lot of books. I learn a lot and I experiment and I'm just going to do it. <laughs> and it's, it, that's the whole idea is, I mean, you have to go out and actually do it. And now if anyone looks at Elon Musk and they say, is this guy smart? Is this guy intelligent? No one's going to look at his, what his resume says. They're going to say, this is what he's done. And this is what he's experienced. Yes. I will listen to Elon Musk. That guy is smart. He knows what he's doing. You know, it's not about what school he went to. Cause I couldn't even tell you what school he went to. I don't know. You know, I don't know if anyone knows, but I think there's so many things in life where the application is the key to learning and development. I mean, I think I've been a passionate language learner for a while and I can watch all these videos and see all these lectures, but until I am actually forced to try and engage and get on with a tutor online and actually have a conversation, they ask me a question and I have to process it and actually do it. All of a sudden you realize, whoa, maybe I'm not that good. But when you practice more and more, that's the biggest way to learn and develop. I remember going back way back to, well, it must've been 11 or 12 years ago when you and uh, Stetter were teaching me how to do hand cleans. And I couldn't do it for the life of me. And I remember there's, there must've been one day where Stetter just showed me it about like 10 times in a row. We just kept doing it over and over and I just couldn't get it. But it wasn't until I spent every day in there. I think like at the end of every workout, just with just the empty barbell, just trying to get the form and get the technique and do it over and over until you finally develop the muscle memory and finally develop. And I think that's just kind of a metaphor that spans across all learning. Um, so that, that, that was really great stuff, Steve. But I want to start shifting gears now because we started talking and you were leading into the whole idea of understanding physiology on even a nano level. For example, we start talking about optimizing human performance and you have a huge background in exercise science, kinesiology, and you know, dare I say biohacking in many ways. So I would love to get your idea on a broad scale, especially working as a rehab consultant and working with a lot of the masses. What do you think are the most important aspects of physiology or what are some of the key areas that people are lacking? And you know, maybe perhaps the best ways that people can immediately make changes to improve their life. Being a rehab consultant gives me access to general population on disability claims. So I get, I get to see it all, which is, which is fantastic and scary at the same time, because right now um, the, the mental health block of business or block of claims is going, is skyrocketing. Um, so that would be, that would be one piece for sure for general population is, is mental health. Make sure that is in line, in order, however you want to describe it. Um, it comes down to one of your pillars and that's happiness. So that's, that's a big, big piece, but what we're finding, I guess, in the disability world and as a rehab consultant, it boils down to a couple a couple trends. Eat better and sleep either better or sleep more. Mm. that's that's really, really what it comes down to. Um, most most people just don't take care of themselves from what you and I and most of these listeners will view as a very basic foundational level. Right. General population doesn't doesn't do that. They don't care if they don't or they don't understand. Some don't care. Some don't understand. And some don't have the resources to be able to even do that. And, and it's no fault of their own. But if you have the ability to control your sleep and your nutrition, you should do so. Um, a lot of what we're seeing on a disability side of things uh, in terms of claims are related to people just not taking care of themselves. Right. That's and the so, biggest thing. Five or six years ago, I would tell you a different story. It was an oil field worker wrapping their snowmobile around a tree and breaking their leg. That right. still happens, but now we're finding a lot more, I guess, preventable things that are putting people um, absent from the workplace. Right. And so when we, if we even take that a step further, obviously diet, nutrition, sleep, what do you think are the biggest keys then? if you are going to structure at even just a base level for the general population, if you had to give, let's say three keys for someone on their diet, nutrition, because I know you have a huge background in diet, nutrition, I've seen your meal prepping. I know you're dialed in, you know, <laughs> we've gone out to eat before. I know you're dialed in. And then, you know, even to talk about sleep, like, what do you think a few are the keys, like the most basic ways for people to listen to this conversation and you know, say, if I'm checking X, Y, and Z boxes, this is going to give me the best bang for my buck. Steve's most basic sleep tips. Yes. I love that. Most, pe most people need to sleep more. Most people need to turn the TV off and get off their cell phone an hour before bed. Love it. Most people are not paying attention to the temperature of their room or their home when they go to bed. 
Those are my three sleep tips that everybody can implement tonight. Exactly. Love it. Right. So three, Steve's three nutrition points that you can implement today. Eat more or eat less. Right. Calories in, calories out. You want to gain weight, eat more or move less. <laughs> if you right. want to, if you want to lose weight, move more, eat less. Right. Very straightforward. Shop the outside of the grocery store. Oh, I love that. The perimeter you rule. Don't, the perimeter, yeah. Just walk around the outside of the store. Everything you need to make on the inside, mostly, is on the outside. Yes. Be smart with your choices. Be very, very smart with your choices. I'm not going to sit here and we're not going to get into nutrient timing, for example. That is that is something where you and I could spend an hour just talking about nutrient timing. And we could bring a nutritionist on and we could have that conversation. That's not something the general population needs to worry about. Getting your house in order, and by house, I mean just your sleep, nutrition, exercise, everything like that comes first above worrying about when you're going to have 15 grams of protein throughout the day, right? right? Like that's, that's not, that's not what the, what the majority need to worry about. Right. And um, you know what, I'm glad you bring that up because I think a lot of people, if they're looking to make changes in their life, whether it's a new year's resolution or it's something that sparked a change in their life and a need to improve in certain aspects, whether that be through the diet, their nutrition, sleep, you know, exercise, you name it. I think a lot of people are overwhelmed because they assume that I need to all of a sudden become like the person I see on Instagram or the professional athlete or actor, or actress that I admire, or, you know, that professional health coach who has everything dialed in. And I think a lot of people are overwhelmed. Well, I have to go straight from never tracking calories in my life and never cooking my own foods to all of a sudden every single meal needs to be hundred percent whole food, organic, you know, fresh grass fed meat. And then every single workout needs to be strategically timed at every single meal. And I think a lot of people realize that to have basic fundamental health and to actually live a long time. Like you don't have to dial it in. Like, obviously that is if you want to reach the upper echelons of high performance and to be elite in everything you do, but to live a good, healthy and long life, it doesn't have to be that perfect. Like you can make mistakes. It's just, it's the Pareto principle. It's the 20, it's the 80% consistency, you know, that is going to come out from just doing making 20% of the changes. So I think it's important to simplify like that because it's not so much that you're underplaying the abilities for people who just, realizing that that will do more change for you than you can imagine. Like just very simple level. It doesn't have to be super, super complex. I mean, if you're in the NHL or if you're a professional athlete and that 1% improvement is going to be the difference between 500,000 and 5 million on your salary, then yeah, you know what, maybe you should look at exactly when am I going to take that 15 grams of protein? Let's go get my blood work done. But if that's not the difference maker for you, you know, I think a lot of people can just kind of take a deep breath and say, you know what, just relax. It's a process. You learn as you go and just make baby steps. You know, it doesn't have to be giant leaps and bounds. I agree hundred percent. And, and I don't, I don't want anything to get lost in the shuffle here, right? Like this is, this is, I'm 33 now. So this is effectively 30. I think I'm 33. Again, I don't pay attention to things that don't matter to me, but it's, that's 18 plus years of doing this. Mm. Right. And if we relate it back to the weight room, take you example in the weight room, we got you to a base level of strength that you came back every year at that same level of strength. You got it back right away. Mm -hmm. Let's say it was your clean. We got you back to a 225 clean every year within a month. Once you were able to achieve that, great. Do we need to really increase that? Well, we can increase it a little bit each year. That's fine. That shows progress that keeps, you know, keeps the numbers happy, keeps the data happy. It looks <laughs> right. good. But once you're at that base level, it enables you to work on the next thing. You started realizing, okay, what's, what's next? Mm, I better look at my nutrition a little bit more. Right. So you spent a summer doing that. Ooh, the next year, you know what? Ah, my skills on the ice, I better focus on these particular things on the ice. So we can back away from the training aspect a little bit because that base isn't going anywhere. That foundation is very, very good. And you're solid with those habits, but then you get to work on what you actually need to work on. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, it comes down to building up that foundation and making sure that it's rock solid and then moving on to start figuring out what else you can optimize. So right. sleep, I think for general population, 
people just don't get enough of it or they're getting way too much and they think oh i need i need 10 hours a day to function oh okay but that's that's like that's a lot of time and i would encourage you to go get a sleep study done to see you know if you actually do need that 10 hours a day right i'm i'm good with six to eight and i know you're good sleep is actually something that you really really focused on um when you figured out holy geez i have to actually prioritize sleep oh yeah right and yeah. i think a lot of people need that awakening um you you can't go to bed at 10 o'clock one night two o'clock the next morning um 11 o'clock the following night you need some consistency there too and again i know i'm harping on it but it goes back to consistency in everything that you do and mm -hmm. folks may say oh but that's boring where's the variety well that's fine one day for lunch i'll have a red pepper the next day i'll have a green pepper <laughs> right, and that's right. enough yeah. right it's not it's not it's not like the variety isn't not having variety won't won't kill me it's what i'm comfortable with and i know that again if i if i won the lottery i would have a, a closet full of black and white uh large v-neck t-shirts that's it done that's it yeah, that's all that, i would exactly. do because and and even now everybody can say what they want to say but i lay my clothes out for the next day the night before mm -hmm. because at 4 30 in the morning when i'm up i don't want to be making decisions about what i'm wearing to the gym that morning that is a waste of my a time but b more importantly and probably the most important thing that we'll talk about today my cognitive capacity hmm. because i only have a certain cognitive capacity during the day and i need to be very careful and efficient with how i spend my time making decisions and what level of cognitive ability that I'm using throughout the day, right? So early on in the morning, great. Yeah, I'll go to the gym and those decisions that I make there aren't very cognitive because it's second nature to me. Right. When I get home and start working and I put in, you know, a day's worth of rehab consulting work, some of those conversations are pretty heavy with people, especially on the mental health side. So cognitively, it can be pretty, pretty draining right uh real estate can be cognitively draining so i have to be very careful about where i spend my i guess cognitive capacity bucket too and most people most people at this level of high performance need to worry about th about where they're spending their their cognition and how they're spending it and what the regeneration process looks like yeah i love that and you know the whole idea of cognitive capacity is something that was kind of an eye opener for me the last few years. And I started thinking in the context of being a professional athlete and being a goaltender where the game happens so fast. And so all decisions are split second. And if I don't have my optimized cognitive capacity, because it's, it's almost like cognitive bandwidth, you know, if you got a YouTube video playing in the background and you're watching Netflix and you know, your friend downstairs is playing a PS five online or something, and you only have so much bandwidth to go around. And so if you are all of a sudden trying to do a zoom call, like we're doing right now, you know, it slows down just that little bit. And I think about our own brain. So if we are performing in any circumstance, whether you could be on a call and you have a cognitively demanding call with a client, or you could be as a professional athlete, or you could be a musician on stage or an actor and actress, if you have other stuff going on in the background, distractions, um, stress, anxiety, that's all pulling away from the cognitive bandwidth that you have and your attention span. And so what happens then is your decision-making drops. Your, it takes longer for you to make decisions and to process information. So you know, you lose split seconds. And I know in my experience and talking to other goalies that have played at higher levels than me, as well as other athletes where it's super fast game, right? The decision-making has to be spot on. If you lose those microseconds, that's the difference between goals and saves. That's the difference between winning and losing. I mean, you look at any professional sports game, you watch like an MLB baseball game in the world series. It's only split seconds between that's a home run and that's a strikeout. And that's the difference between championships and failing. That's the difference between having a 20 year hall of fame career and never making it to the majors. Like it's incredible how important that is. And when you need to prioritize that, a lot of that then comes back to what is Steve's foundation, sleep and eat right. Because that is the precursor to everything we have mentally and into the mental health. And there's just a few other points I, I want to bring up. I love what you said, decision-making. I think, I don't know if it's Mark Zuckerberg, but I thought I read something that he wears the same shirt every day, the same clothes laid out because it's one less decision to make, which I think is absolutely brilliant. And then, you know, something else we could touch on. I, I want to try and transition a little bit into mental health, but before we get there, the idea of motivating people 
why does this matter? Why does sleep become a priority or why does food become a priority? And I, there's an important stat that I don't think a lot of people are really aware of. And I first found out about it from reading uh, Dr. David Sinclair's book, Lifespan. And he's a professor of a bunch of different things, uh, epigenetics and stuff, I think at Harvard. And he talks about, there's this statistic by the World Health Organization called the daily, the disability adjusted life years. And basically what it does is it tells, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but I'll explain it for a lot of the listeners who don't know, because this was relatively new to me, is it calculates how many years of life are lost due to premature death or disability. So basically you don't, you may be alive, but you don't have a quality of life. Like let's say you're stuck in a nursing home or you have disabilities and you can't really enjoy life. And the average years lost due to premature death or disability in the US is about 23 or 24 years. So yes, the US, let's say, for example, may have a lifespan of roughly 80 years, but the average American right now is only living about 55 years of quality life. And to me, if that's not motivation to say, yes, maybe it's boring to have peppers every day and follow Steve's three rules of the diet. But what is the bigger picture here? Is it boring to have start having health issues at 55 years old instead of 80? You know, I think putting into context and realizing what the return on investment is for making these decisions in your daily life is super important. And then that kind of ties back into now we're going to talk about mental health. And so it's something that you've been more and more exposed to. I mean, how do you see this in your line of work, working as a rehab consultant and the values of um, proper lifestyles and having good lifestyles and even how the sleep and diet may impact someone's mental health and other ways that people can begin to mitigate these issues and improve their quality of life in different ways? Sorry, if that's a bit of a loaded question. <laughs> nope. So I, I, as a rehab consultant, again, with just a wide variety of occupations, um, and, and there are high performers that are on disability claims. There's, there are, there's no doubt about that. I have a caseload full of them. I see, and, and to preface this, I'm not a, a registered psychologist. I'm not a mental health professional. We've all taken a handful of courses in it, but so, so take this with a grain of salt. I, I notice, we notice trends. It's an insurance company. Everything's data driven. So everything's based on trends and where we're going, right? Mm -hmm. So I see folks on disability claims at the worst time in their life for typically one of two reasons. Something psychosocially has gone wrong, um, whether that is family, friends, social network, so a, a loss, a grief, um, uh, death, illness, uh, whether a family member or a friend or financial, um, spouse, somebody has lost a, a job, there's been a bad um, investment made, uh, something along those lines, um, legal. So that's another psychosocial influencing factor, we'll call it, uh, whether they're, you know, they're in, in a motor vehicle accident, they're being sued, or uh, again, divorce proceedings, custody battles, that type of thing. So that's, that's one aspect of the mental health that you know, I'm seeing on disability where people are impacted by those psych psychosocial factors. All of those are controllable. All of those are very, very controllable. They may not be controllable point in time, but A, how you respond and B, how you manage the response. Those are controllable things, right? Um, I can't remember. It was, it was, oh, I was having the conversation this morning with Britt. You can get, you can go buy a vehicle on subprime financing and a lender will give you a loan at 20 some percent. Mm -hmm. It's a controllable thing. Work harder, make more money, get yourself out of a bad credit situation. Right. Right. Yes. There are situational things for sure. I'm not saying that's the answer, but if it's, if that's there, then there's no motivation. I can just go take that 20% loan and not care and not have to do anything to fix the underlying problem. Oh, there's medication for my high blood pressure. Instead of going to exercise, I'll just take the medication. Right. That's, that's so backwards, right? That's so, so backwards. I have folks coming to me that are saying, I want to come to the gym and exercise so I don't have to take a blood pressure medication. That's, that's the right approach in my right. opinion. Sorry to go, to go back to the mental health thing on the other side of the coins, so we have the psychosocial pieces. We also have the, what I would call workplace based issues. So poor job fit. Um, so poor job fit, I'd say just lack of interest at work, 
Um, they've reached the highest pay grade with no sort of motivation to do anything more because they're at the highest pay grade. doesn't matter what course they do or anything or what how they perform at work. The top salary is the top salary and that's that's the way it is. So there's those or or um, they're upset with their boss or a coworker or have had some sort of interpersonal conflict issue at at the workplace. So psychosocial and workplace issues based mental health concerns are kind of the two major buckets that we're seeing on disability right now. And the psychosocial things, there's a lot that's controllable there. Once you figure out how to deal with the situation, there's no doubt it will cause depression, anxiety, adjustment disorder, all of those types of things. But on the workplace issues based side of things, that's what we're kind of talking about today when it comes to performance, health and happiness. Where does work and what you do for an income fall into those three buckets. I think that it's okay for you to not be happy with your income stream if you have other things in your life that balance out that happiness bucket. Right. Because it's almost as though you're working to live as opposed to living to work kind of idea. So if it Absolutely. Can, you can still fulfill your needs, that's just a channel to do so. I, I agree. I agree. And there is, if we take the normal person that is working the nine to five or seven 30 to three 30, and I don't want to say that they're miserable because that's not a good thing, but there's no real fulfillment or they just don't necessarily enjoy going to work. They enjoy their paycheck. That's fine. If they're spending the couple hours in the evening, filling up that happiness bucket mm doing whatever they want, even if it's not for a profit, right? right? I, I think that is totally, totally fine. And I'm seeing a lot of people right now leave longer term five plus year experience careers where they are jumping into entrepreneurship without really understanding what entrepreneurship is. They quit their job on a Friday that they got their last paycheck on that payday and Monday they are essentially unemployed or right. self-employed. But how with no can, income. You can't, <laughs> yeah, you can't be you can't be self-employed with no income. Let's be very clear. You are unemployed. <laughs> that's, right. That's the way it is, right? Employment is income. So I, it's, it's, it's interesting if you don't have that solid plan to flip the switch and, and do things right away, it makes it very difficult. And I'm not turning anybody away from, from any of that, but that's a really, really, really quick way to drain your happiness, your health and your performance buckets. If you don't have a plan mm -hmm. and here comes the word again, efficiency, it, it comes down to efficiency you can do both you can make the time for both um the the mental health piece right now with the pandemic going on is the extent of the so severity is increasing and the rate of incidence is increasing i don't see it going anywhere but getting worse and an incidence rate greatly, greatly increasing as companies go through more lockdowns, as the world continuously involves. And we see more and more companies now moving towards adopting a continuous improvement culture, which may involve Six Sigma lean management. And I hate to break it to folks, when you hear the word lean management at work, it equates to job loss. Mm -hmm. This is just a very real reality i guess of when a company brings a consultant like that in to help clean up waste so efficiency typically will mean human job loss not necessarily in favor for ai or equipment it just may mean listen this person here has a few a few hours a week extra we can divide up this person's 40 hours a week worth of work, but it's actually 15 because we calculated they do nothing for most of the week and divide that amongst three or four other people. Right. And I'm not, I, I think companies, and we do a lot of that as rehab consultants and do, and do advise on a lot of that too. Um, 
I don't, I don't see that as a problem. Companies have to make profits and in the world we're in right now will, I mean, what was the, what was the article I saw the other day? I can't remember where it was. I don't know if it was on founder or what, but a, a massive percentage of bank employees will be obsolete in the mm. next X amount of years because right. of machines and computers that'll be able to do those jobs. Right. Um, mental health. As soon as somebody reads that mental health claims will yeah. undoubtedly rise. They'll panic. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. So that's a, again, that's, that's a psychosocial and a workplace factor, you know, kind of meshing into one, but yes, the, the, the mental health, um, piece on disability is through the roof and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Now, when we, and I'm interested to hear your opinion of this, when we talk about high performers, mental health, um, do high performance have, do high performers have a, are they more resilient? Probably I'd like to say yes to that, but that's an absolute. So I'll say maybe, mm-hmm. um, would do do high performance hide it better are they able to manage it better what 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 do you think we all have bad days but we can rebound fairly quickly it seems um but do you where do you think mental health kind of fits in with this high performance mindset that we're talking about today i think it's incredibly important and i I don't want to go into absolutes either, but I do think in general, the people who achieve the highest levels of success are probably the people that manage it the best. And I like the way you said manage it. And when you were initially talking about, okay, how do we manage and respond to the situation? Okay, the situation happened. We experienced some sort of adversity or we lost a job or we lost a game or we failed. I mean, we could look at it as sports context or in any context. X event happened that caused Y issue in my life. But that is concrete. That that is absolute once it happens, that's done. And I think what separates a lot of the high performers is their response to it. So their mindset, and it kind of could come back in one that one way you could look at it from a growth mindset perspective and Carol Dweck and the idea, well, this happened, but I can grow, I can improve, and I can find a way to get better. And that's just ingrained into who you are. Another way you could look at it, which is something that really transformed in my life and dealing with my own issues with anxiety and high stress over high performance and trying to fulfill you know, my ego-driven dreams of being super accomplished in X, Y, and Z. And one of the big things for me was stoicism. And this basically the ancient Greek philosophy that, you know, everything that happens is just as it is. So everything is perfectly in accordance with nature. The past is gone forever, which it is right. Like we'll never be able to go back and change what's done. What's done is done. The future is never going to come. And we could spend all of our time being anxious and worrying about hypothetical situations. And I know I've probably wasted weeks of my life sitting, thinking about all these hypotheticals in my head that 99% of the time they don't happen, but I'm sitting here consuming multiple hours, increasing my levels of anxiety, increasing my stress, decreasing my physical and mental health at the same time, stressing out about some situation that's never going to happen. And it's hard to get yourself over that block, but then you realize, okay, the future is never going to come. The past is gone forever. What do I have right here? What is the process and how can I just make one step to get better? And that comes back to the growth mindset. And so in my mind, those are, I think, kind of big pillars, which comes back to how you manage and how you respond to a situation and allowing you to go forward. And as I've observed with other high performers, and I've had a chance to talk to people and learn from people and play alongside other people at higher levels than me in a lot of different industries, that seems to be a common theme is the more successful the people are, the less they get consumed by what happens. Something went wrong. Great. Let's, let's adapt. Let's move on. You know, whereas I used to be, and you see a lot of people where like something happens to, you know, Joe at work and it's just arms go up in the air and he's just like, well, here we go again. Like the world's going to end. Everything's the end of the world. And then you could have, let's say Sally, who's just like, okay, what next? Take care of business and you move on. You know, it's your growth and your path in life is like a stock market. You know, it's going to be up and down. We hope that it keeps trending upwards like the stock market generally has been, but it's not smooth. It's not linear. You're not going to get there overnight. It's going to be slow and it's going to be full of all these crazy up and downs. And that's what life is. That's the human condition. But I just generally think that having that built in resilience, having that mindset and having that approach to accepting and then also being grateful for what you do have and kind of shifting your approach from the negative side to the positive side, you know, those are all important aspects in my opinion of fighting mental health. And obviously 
it's great to say that in principle. And it's great to sit here and talk about, oh yeah, you just do this, but it's not that simple, obviously. And people go through a lot tougher things than anything I've experienced. And I know I'm fortunate to be in a pretty good situation in my life, but you know, that's kind of the ideas that I take. And I'd love to see if you could even elaborate that on, because you happen to have a phenomenal network and you have have experience working with a lot more people than I have. And for example, with the next move network, working with professional athletes, musicians, all of these people, are those characteristics of mindset and resilience and grit, are those things that you see commonplace in the high performers that you've been exposed to? There's definitely some trends and common traits that you'll see amongst the high performance crowd or high performers. Um, resiliency, efficiency, um, you know, the ability to adapt and overcome uh, solution focused, um, you know, not, not being afraid to reach out to the network that you have. Uh, those are all big things that we see amongst high performers. That's, that's, those are the trends that I notice anyway, for sure. Um, the biggest trend is they all take care of themselves. Mm. Weird. I know, right. <laughs> it's, it's, they all take care of themselves. They have a really good foundation. Their, their, their health is, good their sleep is good all of those the basics the nutrition all that stuff is good they don't have to worry about that stuff so they don't have to take time out of their day to make decisions about food it's it's there in advance they have their their chicken and rice at 3 15 in the afternoon right they they drink when they're thirsty they those things are are basic and don't have to be thought of and where i think people fail is they jump into wanting to be a high performer and work x amount of hours a day and do all of these things but they don't have the basics down and they're spending so much time on the basics that they run out of energy before they even can figure out what they want to do afterwards right um next move network and is is an interesting story i, I think uh, the founder and, and ceo jordan stewart uh called me we, we were talking for a couple of years um and he called me one morning and and he forgets he forgets that i'm in canada or where canada is and what the time zones are i'm just bugging you jordan because he's he'll, he will see this and um it was it was 6 30 in the morning my time and uh i had just gotten home from the gym and he had called and said okay let's let's bring you on let's do this i want you to deal with the hockey side of things and and let's figure it out as we go um but the idea there is yes it is a whole bunch of highly vetted high performing realtors who don't have to worry about real estate because they know how to deal with real estate like the back of their hand the transaction is easy we wanted people that had that foundation but where the high performance aspect kicks in is they know how to deal with athletes and pros and high net worth individuals and they understand how to read people and ask you know uh, motivational interviewing based questions to get the right information um, and to earn trust, those types of things. Um, so it's been it's been interesting, uh, again, because now, you know, we're trying to build this machine during a pandemic is difficult, especially because real estate was shut down in some states um, and a lot of counties uh, state statewide um, in April, May into June type thing. So it was very difficult for a lot of them to get going on that. But again, and, and even now with pro sports largely just being canceled or postponed, it hasn't been easy to have folks that are not getting their two or $300,000 monthly paychecks um, to buy property, which is fine because we deal with it other ways. They're reevaluating, they're purchasing apartment complexes versus personal homes. Um, they're, they're, you know, we're advising them on what the market's like in their area or where they want to invest in and finding them good opportunities that will, that will pay them long term far beyond the end of their career, which I think is critical too, because at this point we're talking about the other thing with, with high performers is they look at career longevity or they look at life as a longevity perspective. They're not necessarily looking at the here and now, but if we're talking about the gym, they're thinking, how can I do this so that I can keep doing this for the next 40 years? Mm -hmm. Or how am I going to generate an income stream that'll last me the rest of my life, not just today and maybe six months from now? 
right? So there's always a longevity piece that high performers seem to have too. And I've seen the transition in sport. Um, and I think most, most strength coaches, most coaches or anybody involved, athletes would involve, involved in, in a high level sport would agree. It's about career longevity. It's not just about playing for a couple of years, making some money. It's about playing for as long as I can, which means I have to stay healthy as long as I can and be a high performer as long as I can. And that translates into high performers at the workplace or entrepreneurs as well. Yeah. You know what? I, I love that you just talked about longevity because this was a shift I made the last couple of years when I was entering into my pro career. And the idea is so there's something quote that I read that hit me. And I think it was talking about one of the trainers, an NHL trainer, he's out in Ontario. I think he's working with, worked with a lot of guys like uh, Connor McDavid and, you know, a bunch of NHL superstars. And he was describing how most of their off season program was dedicated to rehab, not even like training. They weren't doing squats. They weren't doing anything. It was strictly, how can we repair the body and everything that's going on, allow it to function optimally free of injury and give you the best chance of longevity and durability, especially considering, you know, when you're a professional athlete at the highest levels, whether it's the NHL or NBA, it's long, grueling seasons. And another example is Tim Grover, who was the trainer of Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade. And he talks about all the time he spent just building the mechanics of the body. You know, biomechanics comes first. We'll get your strength and power up after, but if you don't have that foundation, how can you perform? And this was a shift that I started making because there was one quote that I saw that said something along the lines of a player who is 100% healthy is more effective than a better player who's 70% healthy. And it's just kind of the a kind of a brain, like a, a light bulb moment for me when I realize, you know, how much can I improve by doing these squats every day? And I'm trying to get my squats up a hundred pounds, or I'm trying to get my deadlifts up, or I'm trying to get my sprint a little bit faster. How much is that improvement in strength and performance or conditioning really going to translate into on ice performance, especially in such a skill specific sport? And I think this can apply to a lot of sports and a lot of ways in life, whether you just talk about general fitness or you're talking about professional careers. So what does that translate? However, if I grind and I push myself super, super hard and I neglect the foundation, I neglect the basic mechanics, I neglect proper form and having you know proper strength through my knees, through my IT bands, through my hips, my adductors. If I neglect that because I'm trying to put up big squats, I'm going to hinder my performance in the long term by sacrificing my health, my longevity. And I spent lots of seasons of my career where I would be having knee issues or I'd have hip issues. And I just, I wasn't quite there. And so when I started thinking about it, you know what? that was actually a net negative where I was hindering my performance more than I was benefiting it. And so the last two years when I was into my pro career, I basically stopped doing all power lifting with the exception of maybe light squats. Like I'm talking, you know, definitely less than 200 pounds on the back squat and just like maybe slow tempo reps. And everything I did was just like plyometrics, but it was a lot of band work, a lot of stretching, a lot of mobility, a lot of yoga. And I found better on the ice plane and I felt healthier and longer. Like I could continue to play at a high level for longer by doing less. And then this ties all back to what you were talking about with the foundation of sleeping and eating, right? You say, well, I got to do X, Y, and Z. If I want to be a high performer, if I want to be the best lawyer in the world, I have to work, work, work. But if you start getting four hours of sleep every night, yeah, you're maybe putting more output at the start, but it's not going to last. You know what I mean? It comes back to what are the basics and you have to build up your foundation. And there's a great quote by a Canadian politician, former politician, maybe Norm Kelly. And he says, you can't pour from an empty cup. So if you don't take care of yourself and fill your glass up first, you can't expect to perform at a high level. It's not like, yes, it may sound boring to follow Steve's three rules, but that is the foundation. That is high performance in a nutshell. And I think that's why so many people don't get to the levels of high performance because they neglect the foundation. They think that they have to start doing Ben Greenfield biohacking. You don't need to do Ben Greenfield biohacking. You need to sleep right and eat right. And then you can slowly tweak to optimize. And one, one last thing on the mental health I wanted to ask you about, because you offered a ton of great advice on there and you start talking about... Um, psychological health in so many ways, how much of our daily habits and our lifestyle choices do you think can be used to improve our mental health in the face of different struggles that people are facing? Do you think that there is, um, you know, reason to believe that sleep and diet and exercise are key treatments and recovery modalities for someone with mental health issues? Because I know a lot of people would tend to separate the physical and mental aspects. If you are experiencing mental health concerns and you go sit down with almost any registered psychologist, uh, registered provisional psychologist, uh, clinical counselor, the first thing in the first appointment that they're going to ask you after you kind of spill out why you're there, are you sleeping? Are you eating? Mm. Are you exercising? 
those are the three things that they're probably going to ask you about. And there's no, it's no different than when, when somebody comes on a disability claim and I'm speaking with them to figure out what's the best rehab program for you and who am I going to refer you to? Right. If you tell me you're not sleeping and I might write a letter to your physician asking them like, what's going on here? And same to their, their psychologist. If you're not exercising, there's a very good chance that I'm going to spend some money on you and get you into you know, a physiotherapy clinic. So you can see the kinesiologist there to be handheld through some exercise, or I'm going to send you to an occupational therapist who is going to meet you at your home and take you out for a walk every other day. And also talk about how to develop structure and routine and kind of get you back to where you were before this health event happened. Mm. So yes, there's something to be said about routine. Routine's boring that's fine it is what it is but oh see and that's the other thing too I, we're going to talk about doug crashley in a minute here and just how much of an influence he was on me subsequently you and doug doug's big thing is it is what it is control mm -hmm. what you can control right mm -hmm. that's one of the key things and then the whole not for everyone thing apply that to your life too mm -hmm. right apply that it extends more than just the weight room right but where I was going with that, with that mental health thing is um, it, it goes down to the basics. Again, people, when mental health suffers and they're suffering from symptoms of depression or symptoms of anxiety, they stop going to the gym or they stop exercising, they stop eating, they stop eating properly or they eat worse um, or stop eating altogether. And then they also, their sleep, it just, the sleep tanks because they're staying up too late or for any number of reasons where they're laying in bed and suffering from, you know, severe anxiety and, and they, they can't fall asleep. And that's perhaps where a medical intervention needs to happen if you go through some counseling and don't necessarily improve your sleep, right? So those are kind of the three, the three big things. Again, those three pillars, right? The nutrition, sleep, and, and exercise. Um, very, very, very important for a base of mental health. Yeah, I love that. And before we get into Doug Crashley, I just want to quickly add to that. And I want people to remember that when you are experiencing anxiety or mental thoughts, you know, everything is manufactured in our brain, right? And so what is our brain? Our brain is full of neurotransmitters. There's electrical signals. We interpret stimuli and we generate these feelings and emotions like this is an internal manifestation right and I what a lot of people I think forget and I didn't really take this into full consideration for the longest time is that that really is part of your physiology like that is brain chemistry like everything is influenced by your hormones by uh, you know neurotransmitters uh, I'm not an expert on this so I don't want to get it over my head with an explanation but in a simple term Everything that happens in your body, and so whether it goes through your diet and it affects your gut, and then everything with your microbiome, and that affects your hormones, that affects your chemicals that pass through your body. It's the same thing with when you exercise, there's chemicals. We talk about glucocorticoids and cortisol and all these stress hormones. You know, all of these things influence your brain. So I think it would be in many ways ignorant to neglect the importance of just physical health and maintenance when we talk about sleep, diet, um, and exercise. I mean, those do affect your brain, they affect your brain chemistry. And so I think a lot of people really need to realize that that is actually a treatment for mental health issues. And it, it, there's a reason why it is promoted by so many people and why you're talking about the way you do, because there is science that adjusts that. It's hard for us to understand because you're like, well, why is, you know, going for a walk out in the sunlight? How is that going to help with my anxiety? But it, it does. And it's just, it's hard to connect those dots in many ways. But I think that's an important piece that I'd love to dive in later. But let's go back to Doug Crashley for a second. And he's the founder of Crash Conditioning based out of Calgary. And so my first year, I believe that's correct, I think, um, which is one of the premier hockey training programs. And I know he's got some phenomenal world class athletes, I think Duncan Keith and Mike Green, for example, some Calgary guys that train out of there and so many others. And I know he was a big influence for you. Because when I first started training with you, that was crash conditioning at the time in Lethbridge. And unfortunately, crash conditioning didn't stay. But so like you said, subsequently, I got a little bit of benefit. But I'd love if you just talk about him and his philosophy and maybe how that's inspired you and how that, you know, makes a positive impact in people's lives and come, some of the values that we can take away from that, that everyone can take away from that. You know, I, I, I bring up Doug and crash just because of, you know, over the years and the conversations we've had, 
if I'm struggling with something, Doug's the first guy to say, Stevie, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is, right? And most people will realize a phrase like that. They'll say, oh, it is what it is. It's dumb. They'll say that, whatever, right? I, right. I know there's people with that school of thought, but yeah. what he's getting at is, is it is what it is. It's, it's, it's day by day right? That's in the past. That's a previous situation. Learn, move on, get on to the next thing, mm -hmm. right? And and there's a guy who has been an unbelievable mentor for me over the years, and I owe him, owe him the world, uh, even just watching from, from the background and from the shadows. Um, the, the con It's just one of those guys where, where you and I have the conversation, Doug and I will have a conversation, and I hope he gets some benefit on his end, but the benefit on my end is is amazing and there's always a tidbit or two that comes out of conversations that are just they're game changers mm -hmm. and 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 i've jotted a couple things down even as we're chatting here right uh, um, of things that i want to put in my notebook about high performance and just thoughts to explore at some point in the future and uh, it's it's nice to have people like that in your corner and again it speaks to having that network another trend that i find with high performance is is they have that large network mm -hmm. and it's a broad network if we're talking about a lawyer they don't just have lawyers in their network they have folks from all walks of life and as more people watch and listen to more of your content they're going to see what your network looks like between me and um naturopaths and psychologists and just um u.s military just right. just everything out there you know, you have in your network, but you positioned yourself to do that. And we had, we had many conversations when you were in university. You're not just there to get your education, right. especially when you go to an American school, the alumni association will be huge and it'll be huge forever. And they can really, really help you at most, most us schools. Um, it's really important to go to university with the eye and ear of networking and leveraging connections and meeting people. You will arguably get more out of the relationships that you build during your university tenure than perhaps the piece of paper may lend you to think. 100%. I, and I can vouch for that right now. I can tell you that the connections <laughs> and the network I've built through Norwich has been, it's blown me away even more. And I feel like it's an exponential curve where as I get further and further away and Norwich is further in the rear mirror, that network becomes more and more prominent in my life. You know, whereas the actual education itself was terrific and I, I'm super appreciative of it, but that doesn't hold the same growing value. Whereas it's the network and the connections and the relationships that do. So we've been going on for a little while here, Stephen. I feel like we, <laughs> I feel like you and me, we could talk forever. So I want to try and just slow down a little bit and make it uh, hopefully a, a little bit of a practical ending for people. So I'd love before we get into the closure for you to share with us what are Steve's high performance habits. So we got Steve's three rules, you know, uh, for fitness and we, or for diet. Sorry, and we got Steve's three rules for sleep. And you know, you're throwing in the little tidbits here that snuck into the conversation, like getting up at 4 30 a.m. and going to the gym, you know, high efficiency and you know, phones off before bed and these little things. But just a quick rundown, what are some of Steve's high performance habits that you use to at the end of the day optimize your efficiency? I think the, the big thing for me is time management. And I'm grateful or lucky or however you want to describe it to be good at what I'm involved in. So I can do an eight hour work day in three or four. Mm. And I can have a 40, a traditional 40 hour work week, objectively speaking, done by Wednesday at noon, starting Monday at 6 a.m. Right? Like those are, those are, those, that allows me to have extra time to do a lot more in the evenings, weekends, that, that type of thing. Right. Um, or to take phone calls at 9am on Friday morning, like, <laughs> like we are now. Right? right. But I, but that means I worked late last night and it's, it's about moving things around and, and time management. So for me, high performance in terms of the habits and get up at a consistent time weekends, 
are not an exception. Um, pick a time, get up at it. Go to bed at a consistent time. Um, don't use your phone before bed or try try not to, or use some of these, these light filters that are out there. Use some of these apps, especially if you're on your computer, use Flux, like use some of these programs. They do help, they will, they will improve your sleep. If you're having trouble sleeping, figure it out, figure it out, yeah. right? The old saying goes, is all the crash boys listening to this, <laughs> sleep, at, sleep at night, right? Yeah, sleep sleep at, at night, night. And, and, and figure, figure out your sleep, okay? That's a major, major thing. Um, Eat when you're hungry. I don't care if it's every two to three hours, but if you know that you need 3,500 calories a day, or if you need 1,200 calories a day, divide that up and know that if you eat all your food before noon, you're done for the day. So learn how to pace yourself throughout mm -hmm. the day. Okay. Different for you on the carnivore diet right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> eat, eat when you're hungry. Exactly. Eat when you're hungry. Yeah, if you're hungry, just eat. Right. That's the rule of the carnivore is eat it when is, you're hungry. It is. Yeah. And yeah, because if you're typically eating a lot of meat and very nutrient dense, you're not going to be as hungry as often. So it tends to hold you over a little bit longer, but it's a good rule of thumb. Everybody always says, um, Steve, you have to, you have to cut yourself some slack and give yourself a break. Um, I don't know. I don't know what that, I don't know what that means. Um, and, and that's, I, I understand what they're saying, but some people are just wired very, very differently. Right. I'm wired. I'm wired to work. That's, that's what I'm wired to do. I'm wired to, to work and to learn and to hack time and physiology down to the, the absolute minutia to get there. Mm -hmm. So I'm into maximizing capacity, however that looks, and into longevity. Um, again, it's it's funny. I, I had it. I don't know if this is funny or gruesome or what or a warning, but I had an anesthesiologist of all people uh, a couple of years ago walk up to me and tell me I was we were at an event and I was hustling and bustling, typical. Just if I, I have one speed and that's on, yes. right? Just like a police dog, and <laughs> and he walked up to me and he goes. Um, you're, you're going to be an early grave. He oh. said, I'm like, what, what does that mean? He goes, it took me three divorces to learn how to slow down. <laughs> so sometimes I remember that if I'm, <laughs> if I'm whining or complaining about having to drive all over the city from meeting to meeting or whatever the case may be, but I've learned from that. It is 10 30 in the morning right now for us, our time, right? right? 10 31. I have an 11 o'clock uh, showing this morning. Um, I scheduled the first home to actually be just down the street. That's the efficiency. I love that. That you have to have if you want to perform at the highest of levels. Mm -hmm. It's deliberate. You have to. Yes. And I, 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 I just want to touch on one of the points you made um, quickly about all the noise in the background in your brain. Multitasking is gone, thing of the past. You and I are focused on this conversation. We're not sitting here answering texts or emails or doing everything right. else that we possibly yeah. have my, to my do. My phone's on airplane mode. It's This is exactly. just our conversation, yep. that's it, yeah. Exactly, so it's 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 very interesting that, you know, to, to cancel out a lot of that background noise, I think you need to get really good at just focusing on the job at hand mm. and not necessarily worrying about everything that you have to do at one time or doing 22% of this and 8% of that. And then working on this other project for 6%. No, just, just get something done mm. because not only will that have that sense of accomplishment and just dealing with it, you know, what's the old adage, get up in the, the Admiral, get up in the morning, make your bed type thing. Yeah. You can check it uh, off. List. General McRaven, I think, or yeah. know, his name. Yeah. Make your bed. He yeah. Wrote that book. Yeah. And just get it done. Exactly. First thing done. Fantastic. But get these, start crossing these projects off, get them fully done, move on to the next thing. Right. Momentum is everything. Exactly. Get that multitasking mentality out of your head. It's no different than, than myself at work as a rehab consultant. I open a file. I do everything I possibly can in that file. I close it and I put it away. Mm, yeah, that's it. I don't want to go back to it. I don't want to have 14 files open at once. It's the same in your brain. Don't have 14 files open and run your brain like Windows 97. <laughs> 
right? Like it just, it, that's, that's not an efficient or effective and it's not sustainable. You're going to crash right. like any yes. Windows product, right? It's not, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But that's just the way it is though, right? It, it yes. doesn't, you're not going to be efficient. And for me, right, if, if yes, okay, we give those, we joke about Steve's three efficiency habits for sleep and nutrition and exercise, whatever. But if you explain your situation, then I can help refine that down to the minutia, right? Okay, I'm sleeping, but I'm having trouble here, here, and here. Great, let's try X, Y, and Z. Mm. That's that's where the fun really starts to optimizing human performance and overall high performance. Um, when it comes to performance, I think for me, the number one thing is is efficiency is absolutely key. So figure that out, hack your efficiency, hack your time, really figure out a structure that works for you and make sure that it is sustainable. And if it's not sustainable, you better be able to pivot, figure it out, and then carry on from there. So be adaptable at the same time. Um, Health-wise, eat, eat properly, sleep better, we'll call it, and and get your exercise. Figure, figure out some sort of exercise routine or regime. Um, and then from a, a happiness perspective, I know I'm I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but this from a great. happiness perspective, I really encourage people to as you and I discussed, I think performance and health most people have under their belts, or at least the circles are quite big. But when when it comes to happiness, that circle might be small or or misshapen or not quite figured out. And I want folks to know that that's totally fine, right? Like I'm 33, been working since I've been 15. I still don't know what I really want to do, Mm. right? I probably won't ever know what I really want to do, but I'm finding passions and blending them together to figure that out as I go. Um, And developing a really cool skill set and an amazing network along the way. So in terms of happiness, just, I don't, I don't care. Right. Like get a dog, um, play with Lego. Like what, what, I I don't know. Right. Like this is, you're the, it's the wrong, it's the wrong person for me. Happiness is just knowing that my health and performance are top notch and that happiness comes for me in the day to day Mm -hmm. wins and doing things like this with yourself, being able to talk about, uh, Doug and and Jordan in conversations like this and knowing how grateful I am to have them in my network and my life and pick up the phone and know they'll answer, right? Um, those those types of things. For me, that helps define happiness for me. It's not necessarily about building a new house or buying a new vehicle or those those types of things. They may keep me happy for the 18 second attention span that I have on a new vehicle, but it's not, it's not sustainable or longer term for me. So I take my happiness as those daily wins. And in a sense, I think that kind of hits on the gratitude piece, right? Um, With without saying it, that 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 really is what gratitude is. I don't necessarily write three things down that I'm grateful for every day, but I'm very aware of it through celebrating the small wins which contribute to that happiness. Yeah, that's part of it. No, you, this was amazing, Steve, because you did take it. Uh, my last question on the advice was your best piece of advice for health, happiness, and performance. So for the sake of redundancy, I'll quickly summarize what I took away from this. Health, sleep more, eat properly, and exercise. Pretty straightforward. And honestly, that's going to get you so far. Happiness, there are three th- keys that I took out of this last little tidbit that you had, and that's gratitude, passion, and purpose. So be grateful for what you have find something you're passionate about and have a greater purpose every day. And if you do that alone, like, I mean, that is where it sounds like, and I can see it in your face and hopefully people can hear it coming across to where that's where you're achieving fulfillment because you are excited about this. And then finally performance, it is efficiency. Find your inefficiencies, reflect on what you can improve on how to do it and figure it out. I mean, it's, it's simple. It, it's kind of harsh in some ways, but there is always a way to figure it out. If you are motivated, you will find ways to become more efficient. So with that, Steve, I know you got to show in right away. If people are interested to learn more about you, learn more about Next Move Network, all of these different things, where can people find you or learn more about the things that you're interested in, the things you're doing? Uh, maybe just put in a plug for wherever you'd like to, to plug in here. Easiest easiest way is find me on Instagram. I know you'll tag uh, yes. username in here, uh, sold by Remax Steve. Um, 
go on there, get a hold of me, just watch watch what I'm doing. Um, I keep a lot of my private life private because if it were public, I'd expect to collect taxes on it. So um, <laughs> I keep my private life fairly private, but you'll see tidbits of what's going on in the business world, everything from the strength and conditioning to the, to the gym, to, um, you know, just the, the next, next move network. You can check us out uh, on all forums of social media, next move network. Uh, I encourage you to follow some of our realtors that are in your area. If you are a pro athlete listening to this or, or amateur athlete, anybody, um, and you are interested in real estate, in purchasing something or renting something down the road, please get a hold of me so I can get you that white glove service that you deserve from a vetted real estate professional who's not going to pull any wool over your eyes and flat out tell you, no, this is not the right property, or yes, this is a good fit for you, depending on your situation, we can get you set up with them. And that's not a plug. That is me wanting to protect all of the athletes out there from the maliciousness that follows any sales based industry. Yeah. Oh, I've, I fortunately never had to have any issues with that, but I, I completely understand. And I really appreciate everything, you know, Steve, you've done for me and hopefully all the listeners get a ton of information out of this and I'll be sharing all that stuff. I'll also share links and tags to next move network and, and so many other things and try and get that out there. But again, thank you so much for taking the time. I love doing this. I, I miss the fact that we're in lockdown right now, so we couldn't do this over uh, a butter chicken at OJ's or something else, but uh, perhaps soon we'll be able to reconnect with that. Yeah, I think I think there'll uh, there's so much that I've pulled out of this that I think there'll be a version two at some point. Uh, oh in yes, the future, absolutely. For sure. Yeah, I'm excited to dive even deeper into things. So thank you again, Steve. Uh, I really appreciate your time, and I'll tell the listeners to stay tuned for part two at TBD. Sounds good. Take All care. Right. We'll talk to you soon. To discover more. The full transcript of this episode with all citations is available on the website, and you can also contact me on social media with any questions or comments. If you found this episode useful or think that it may help someone else, I encourage you to pass it along. Thank you all for joining me on this journey to lifelong health, happiness, and higher performance. And remember, always be grateful, love yourself, and serve others.